science really has no limits. It's making the impossible possible. How about living for 120 years without actually getting sick or frail? David Sinclair's research is extending human lifespans, and with that, we could actually prevent many nasty diseases such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, or even Alzheimer's. How about going into space? Chris Mason is working on a 500-year plan to prepare humans for intergalactic space travel. But do we really realize how far we have already gotten here on planet Earth? Anna Rosling Rönlund is going to take us on a mind-blowing journey of progress across years and countries, and she will blow away your entirely wrong assumptions about the state of the world. Because we live in exceptional times, and often we don't even know how far we have already come here. So I want to demonstrate this uh, today, this morning. I would like to ask you to do, join me in a little experiment, and all please get up from your chairs. Some of you may know this already from last year, but we have so many new faces, so we're going to do it again. So you may sit down again if your birthday, and only if your birthday, falls on an even day of the month. So if your birthday is on the 2nd, 4th, 6th, 8th, 10th, you get the gist, you may sit down again. If your birthday is on an uneven day of the month for the last uh, 28th, 30th, please remain standing. Okay, what does this mean? Child mortality, just 200 years ago, was 40%. That means that 4 out of 10 children did not survive their first 5 years of life. And those of you who just sat down would have not lived to see their fifth birthday. Okay, here comes the next one. Let's see. If you're over 35, please do sit down. I know. Sorry about that. I know it's nasty so early in the morning. Well... Just 100 years ago, the average life expectancy was just 35 years. I would have as well not lived long enough to give this lecture, but then again, you know, like if you look around, wouldn't have been that many people to enjoy it. So, okay, everybody, just sit down, take a deep breath, and just be happy for one second to be here today. And why is it really that we're here today? Well, it's all really thanks to science. By far, the biggest killers in the past used to be infectious diseases and famines. And what really stopped them were scientific discoveries in biology and medicine and agriculture, chemistry. And I want to show you some of these discoveries because it really starts uh, with the basics. About 180 years ago, an Austrian doctor discovered that something as simple as washing your hands saves lives. And then, shortly after, Louis Pasteur developed the germ theory of disease. And then we learned how to combat germs with antibiotics, saving countless lives. And today we have vaccines that protect us against infectious diseases. For example, the vaccine against polio was developed in the 50s, since then saved more than 120 million lives. And the vaccine against uh, smallpox exists already for 200 years, and thanks to that, smallpox became the first disease to be eradicated from, the, from Earth, doesn't exist anymore, and has saved more than 530 million lives since then. The other big killer in the past used to be famines. But then came the steam, steam engine and electricity and triggered the Industrial Revolution. And with the Industrial Revolution came prosperity, and this allowed our world population to grow. So at the onset of the Industrial Revolution, we were about one billion people on the planet. And it took us 200,000 years to get here. Within just 130 years, we doubled from one billion to two billion. And within just another 70 years, we went from 2 billion to over 7 billion people on the planet today. 
and with really two scientific discoveries that allowed this massive growth in world population to happen. About 100 years ago, two German chemists developed a way of how to synthesize uh, nitrogen and use it as a fertilizer, and with that, saved more than 2.7 billion, billion lives. And in the 1940s, Norman Borlaug developed ways of how to produce high-yield, disease-resistant wheat, and with it triggered the Green Revolution, saving another billion lives. I think it's becoming quite clear that science saves lives. It has allowed us to live longer, healthier, and better lives than ever before in human history. But we are not done. There's so much more to be done, and I think it really boils down to four major challenges that we need to resolve as humanity within the next 10 to maybe 20 years. So here comes challenge number one. We all have a right, everybody around the planet has a right for a healthy life. And in fact, we want to entirely eradicate disease. 10,000 diseases already have a cure, but 20,000 still have no treatment. And the fact is that still today, too many people have actually no access to medicine. Jay Iyer is going to change that. Her foundation works with pharmaceutical companies to bring medicine to some of the poorest people in the world. Grégoire Cortine makes people with spinal cord injuries walk again. Mavi sanchez Bibis. Uh, Uh, takes uh, patients uh, into virtual reality to treat mental disorders. And today we as well have gene editing and genetic engineering to edit our, our genome and with that treat many deadly diseases. But that as well gives us the power to design and engineer ourselves. How far should we go? What's good? What's bad? Spencer Wells will get to the bottom of these questions. Here comes the second challenge, and that is that we need to provide food for all people on the planet. Because as I mentioned before, currently we're over 7 billion people, but within the next 70 years, we're going to stabilize, not continue to grow, 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 but really stabilize at 11 billion people. So more than ever, we need science and technology to provide food for everybody. And previous scientific advances have given us pesticides and fertilizers, and that wasn't bad because it saved billions of lives. But now we need new type of technologies to produce more using less resources and less of these substances. Matt McCabe, for example, he's using drones and mini satellites to scan entire fields, and he knows exactly when to deliver water to crop or which type of crop is growing better than another one. And Claire Kremen works on sustainable agriculture, and she'll show us how that will produce food while at the same time as well protecting our environment and protecting biodiversity as well. This is the, let's see whether I can count, third challenge. And that is that we need to provide energy for all people on the planet. Because the reality is that today, about 10% of the people use up 50% of the entire world's energy. But tomorrow, many more people will want to use much more energy because as countries move out of poverty into prosperity, people want to have light, they want to have fridges, they want to have meat on the table, and they want to drive a car. And of course, the energy that we need to provide needs to be clean and it needs to be renewable. And thank God that solar and wind are now already cheaper than fossil fuels. But to really revert climate uh, change and global warming, we also rely on nuclear energy, because that's still today the, the most efficient, safest way of how to provide clean energy for billions of people. And of course, there's as well the new type of technologies. For example, artificial intelligence reduced the amount of energy necessary for cooling Google's data centers by 40%. And this could be done on a much, lar a much larger scale because as more devices are being, getting connected to the Internet of Things, we could imagine that artificial intelligence will as well help us to regulate the power supply of entire cities, maybe even countries. 
So then maybe we don't need that much more energy, but we can regulate the power supply much more efficiently. And here comes actually the most important challenge that we have to resolve now. Because everything that I said so far needs to be done within the boundaries of a healthy planet. Because there's a downside to the tremendous improvements in our quality of life as we live longer and healthier and richer lives than ever before. We are as well polluting our air, polluting our oceans, destroying our forests to grow more food, with driving other species into mass extinction. And we brought our climate maybe to a tipping point from which there might be just no return. So the next 10 to 20 years need to see a complete switch to clean energy and sustainable food production if we want to stand a chance for our children or other species to enter next, the next century. And this really is a challenge in which everybody needs to participate. And Bowser is creating a network of millions of citizen scientists that are collecting data about the state of the planet and about the environment. And we, as scientists, can come up with solutions then to these challenges. And in fact, we can use science to drive, drive fact-based decision-making. Stefan Mergenthaler from the World Economic Forum will show us how science, scientific facts and data can be used to drive global decision-making to speed up these solutions to these challenges. And here comes the great news. There is more scientists on the planet than ever before, and we are making scientific discoveries at an exponential rate. Currently, there is 8 million researchers worldwide, commanding over a worldwide R&D budget of $2.3 trillion, trillion, using this to make more discoveries, producing more scientific data, more research articles. And this is generating a beautiful innovation and prosperity cycle. Research and innovation lead to economic growth, and governments and industry then have more money to pump back into our research labs. But here comes the bad news. This innovation cycle and prosperity cycle is currently severely bottlenecked by the way how we publish and disseminate our science. And here comes the problem. So of the 2.6 million research articles that are published every single year, still today, 86% are locked away behind very expensive subscription paywalls. They're not accessible to many researchers, even at the richest universities, yet alone innovators at companies or forget about citizens or citizen scientists. And that is a, a pity because it hinders progress, it does so massively. And it's also a shame because open science and open access works. It works extremely well. Let me show you. So here we've taken the world's 20 largest publishers, and in gray you can see their subscription journals, and in yellow you see their open access journals. And what we are looking at is average citation rates to articles published within the last three years, so very recent. And what you see is that across most publishers, open access is generating more impact, more citations. In the American Physical Society, open access is generating more citations. Oxford University Press, open access is generating more citations. Springer Nature's open access journals generate nearly twice as many citations as their subscription journals, at the same rate as the open access journals of Frontiers. Over here, you do have uh, Elsevier. And indeed, their subscription journals are still generating more citations than their open access journals, but only at the same rate as the open access journals of PLOS and less citations than the open access journals of Springer Nature or Frontiers. Ladies and gentlemen, the reality is that today, open access is generating more impact than science published behind subscription paywalls. Now just imagine how we could accelerate the entire scientific process if we were to make all of this open. 
And that's really what we set out to do about 10, 11 years ago when we started Frontiers. And our mission is very simple. We are here to make all of science open. And of course, this is a mission that's, that goes far beyond just us here in this room. It requires a change in the entire ecosystem, from funders to universities to a flip of all the subscription publishers to open access. But change is really as well induced by leading through example. And we at Frontiers want to lead this transition to open science and provide this example. And in fact, we have a very concrete plan in place. We call it 100Q in 5. And that means that we want to publish 100,000 high-quality articles per year by 2021. We want to become actually one of the largest and most cited publishers in the world. Now, are we dreaming or are we delivering? Let's have a look. Of the 8,000 or so publishers that are out there, Frontiers Today is already the 16th largest. But our goal is really to get up there to the top five, because these are all subscription publishers publishing in the range of 100,000 to maybe 600,000 articles per year, and it's mostly behind subscription paywalls. And this is setting the default for the entire industry. So it's paramount that a new open access publisher is, breaks into that, uh, into that league and changes that default. We said we want to become one of the most cited publishers in the world. Dreaming or delivering? Well, out of the 20 largest publishers today, Frontiers is already, on average, the fourth most cited. This is all on, on recent articles published. And these are higher average citation rates than Elsevier or Wiley or Springer Nature as well. But our impact is more than just on academia. It's really as well on the entire world. Frontiers articles have been viewed and download, uh, downloaded across the entire globe more than half a billion times. In all of the research hubs, Europe, the US, China, of course, but as well in economic and innovation hubs such as the Silicon Valley or Shenzhen. And that's no surprise, really, because all companies today depend on science to survive and thrive. And in fact, today we're going to as well welcome an amazing uh, panel of industry leaders. They're going to talk about amplifying the impact of scientific innovations and how we can get them out of the labs to the markets where they are needed in a much more efficient and faster way. Now let's look a little bit about how we do it at Frontiers. So what's our magic formula here? Well, we take our um, inspiration really from the aviation industry. There's more and more flights up in the air, while at the same time, flying is becoming safer and safer. So what is it that you need to fly safely? I think we would all agree we need great pilots, right? And that's really you here in the room. It's you, the chief editors, and your editorial networks that are those pilots. And in fact, we take great care and great pride in building amazing journals really around the best researchers in the world from all the top institutions, from Harvard, uh, NIH, Max Planck, Cambridge, and so forth, Chinese Academy of Science, you name it. But great pilots uh, are not enough to fly safely. You as well need an amazing ground team to support you and to guide you. And that's really the Frontiers team. We have now more than 500 people that provide this type of guidance and support. And Miriam and Marie will tell you exactly how we do it to provide a great service. But what makes Frontiers truly, truly unique is a very tight interplay between technology and people. In fact, we collect all the feedback that you have, that authors have, that our ground teams have, and we translate it into standard operating procedures and then eventually into code. And you can see this, these types of improvements as new features on the website. 
And Daniel today is as well going to tell you how we now use artificial intelligence to publish even better science. So with that formula in place, the best pilots, the best ground team, and the best technology, we're actually well on track in executing this plan. And with that, setting this example to make science open. And that is truly important, because science has saved our lives and that of our kids many times over. And in the future, it will continue to do so. But now we need science as well, more than ever, to help us protect our environment and other species too. Now, we have come a long way, but we've come to where we are despite severely restricted to our res access to our research outputs. So we hope that in the near, near future, all science will be open, it will be machine-readable, and it will be AI-ready. And that's really the mission that we have here at Frontiers. And that is when we will see innovation at an even more accelerated pace. It will continue to drive our economies and will give us all the solutions that we need for a sustainable future. And we believe that this future is bright because there have never been more scientists on the planet than today. They've never had more resources than today and they've never made as many scientific discoveries as today. We are in a better position to solve any type of problem than ever before in human history. So we will have clean energy, sustainable cities, sustainable food production, we will live longer and healthier, and we will drive our economies at the same time. We can have it all. But just as this very simple discovery 180 years ago um, by the, by the Austrian doctor that, who showed that something as simple as washing your hands can save lives, we now need to as well take this very, very simple step and make our science open. Thank you. Thank you for being here today.